Chapter 18. Lily. I still haven't talked to Josh about the Cornell letter. I have, however, exploded at him for a million other reasons that have nothing to do with his impending dash for the North. He has been yelled at for leaving his socks by the bed, for getting to close the bathroom door so that I felt cold while taking a shower, and accidentally setting the alarm clock 20 minutes ahead so that I got less sleep than I wanted. I have yelled at him for everything, but what is really going on? I'm scared that Josh, my thoughtful, quiet, and measured Josh, might be looking at exit options. I feel like there's a distance growing between us, one that I might be causing with all of my arguments over nothing, and I don't like it. I tend to argue over stupid minutiae, but avoid real conversations about what it's actually bothering me, like it's the bubonic plague. Footnote 36. 36. See what I mean about my flair for drama? Why can't I just say, I tend to avoid conflict with others, or I try to avoid conflict at all costs? Years of therapy have taught me that in situations like this, it is best to blame my mother. So I will. Here goes. I must have inherited this propensity toward the dramatic from my mother, Diana Walker. She was often afraid that we would fall on a toy left in the middle of the room because it would cause us to break our necks, the most likely and incurable of injuries. Or there was the Walker family favorite of, put on socks or you'll catch your death. The conclusion there is an obvious one. Not wearing socks while walking on a hard floor will automatically lead to the death of young children. Is it any wonder? Okay, that's the footnote. <laughs> Let's find our way back to the text. Josh is not all also Josh is also not an extremely confrontational person, which means when things go wrong, parentheses, which they haven't ever before, but we didn't know each other that well before we got married. And parents. I don't really know how we'll go about solving them. What is still getting at me though? is that I'm not ready to have children yet, and I just can't explain away that feeling. Could it be about Josh? What is it that keeps me from wanting to move forward with our life as a family? The complicated truth is that I feel guilty complaining about anything when my clients' lives are so hard. Instead of appreciating Josh for all he is, I feel guilty for having a loving husband that doesn't abuse me, Footnote 37. Footnote 37. And I do appreciate that Josh doesn't actively abuse me, but I do wonder sometimes if he understands me at all. He talks about how much he loves me, and he certainly is affectionate, but I constantly wonder whether he just needed someone to come with him to Hiawassee Springs, and whether I just seemed like the most willing idiot. He is withdrawn. He never wants to talk about our relationship. And sometimes I feel like I don't know him any better now than on the day we met. Okay, that was the footnote. I feel guilty for com complaining about having to live in a town I didn't choose when my clients choose love and it bites them in the face. I feel guilty for my easy ride when my clients have to make Sisyphean efforts just to keep safe and alive. At times, I feel like I could drown face first in puddles of my own guilt. Guilt aside, the simple answer for why I am not ready for children is my clients. I keep whatever professional distance is required by the Florida rules on ethics and professional responsibility. But hey, it is hard not to hug them to pieces sometimes. Sure, we provide legal services for free, and sure, they couldn't pay us, even if they wanted to, but they find other ways to compensate me for my time. One of my clients made homemade enchiladas for me after I had missed a day of work due to a nasty little stomach virus. 
Another gave me a birthday present of chocolates and a clear plastic bear with angel wings that she painted green eyes on to look like me, and she called it her abogada lily bear. Once I had a good Samaritan neighbor bring in a battered woman in need, and to thank me for providing legal services for his friend, he sent me a CD of Christian music that he had recorded, as well as a paperback copy of his self-published work on the mysteries of the great beyond. Footnote 38. I tried to get Josh to assign it to his freshman English class, but he wasn't feeling it. The enchiladas were definitely the tastier option, but I hadn't laughed so hard as I did when I saw Craig's self-titled book, quote, Craig Wayne Johnston unlocks the secrets to the universe, unquote. My sweet clients, I know that if I do not provide them with legal representation, they may have no other options. That reality weighs heavily on me. That notion of being needed at work is new and different for me. I used to spend even more hours working than I do now, but I wasn't personally invested. I would leave work and trot around DuPont Circle, lingering for hours with friends over mango mojitos, digesting every last bit of the conversations we shared regarding our potential future boyfriends. I spent countless hours over the last five years going on dates, preparing for dates, and debriefing about the dates with each of my many friends in D.C. I don't do that anymore, and undoubtedly, my life is richer as a consequence. I have Josh now, and I care so much more about my job that there isn't much left over to gap about with him or anyone else when the day is through. I was nonchalantly looking through the thin things to do in the About Town section of the Hiawassee Springs Gazette last week when I found the key to how Josh and I would climb out of our first slump. There it was in all its splendor. The perfect text alongside a picture of a really happy pig wearing a cowboy hat and a big grin. That's right, ladies and gents, the 82nd annual Northwest Florida County Fair. Sweet! Footnote 39. I'm doing a double fist pump gesture, which you unfortunately can't see right now, but if you could, you would better understand my feeling of celebration. The power of words can only take us so far. Josh, 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 look! I grabbed the paper, happy pig picture emblazoned front and center, and ran over to Joshua, thrusting the paper on top of the stack of student papers he was grading. He didn't really have much choice but to read the selection. Can we go, can we go, can we go? I playfully tugged on the right sleeve of his worn thin gray t-shirt that I had inherited eons ago from an ex-boyfriend and passed on to Josh because it looked better on him. Footnote 40. Um, I kind of never told Josh the true origins of that shirt. Why ruin his enjoyment of a per perfectly nice t-shirt? Sure, Lily, he replied, without even one one hundred thousandths of the same level of enthusiasm that I showed. The fair goes on for ten days. I'm sure we can find a day when we can go together. He sounded like he was trying to make me happy, but not like he really cared to go on his own. I instantly felt crushed, like a little girl on a family road trip who tries and tries to get the large truck driver racing alongside their station wagon to honk his big loud horn, and the driver sees the little girl and knows what she wants, but he refuses. I felt crushed, like that little girl, footnote 41, felt crushed, footnote 41. Yeah, okay, fine, I was that little girl. What kind of sick person would refuse a cute little girl's wishes to hear a loudly honked horn? That day, the one without a loud honk, was the day I learned that the world would not always be a friendly place. Still, a few weeks later, after a long, hard week, we went to the fair on a Friday night. I loved the excess of the fair and the sheer insanity. 
the sun was setting as we arrived, and I made it my goal to eat just enough so that I would I would be sickeningly, sickeningly full, but not too sick to actually prevent me from going on the turbonator, and not so sick as to actually vomit. It was a precarious balance, especially as I danced my way from the fried Oreos, footnote 42. Don't you dare judge me. To the stir-fried okra, to the other fried delicacies of the evening, candy bars, brownies, and peanut butter cups. Josh had lemonade. One lemonade. He was not embracing the caloric extravagance with the same tenacity I had dedicated to trying to acquire type 2 diabetes that very evening. The fair was, in a word, awesome. They had five different species of roosters. The animal room had local sheep, chickens, and pigs, and then some imported varieties of animalia, which were very pleasing to me. The following were present the alpaca, the llama, and the highland cow, footnote 43. This animal hails from Scotland and has a most pleasing hairdo involving a gentle forward comb of the mane between the ears and over the snout. Occasionally, I like to comb Josh's hair this way, and when he is feeling charitable, he will allow this coiffure and say it in the Scottish accent, which sounds like moo, I'm a Highland Coo. It is adorable. Okay, that was the footnote. <laughs> After we, parentheses, well, more like I, and parents, played with the animals for a while, we watched some barely semi-professional glee club singers do a mix of singing and clogging for as long as we could possibly stand. Footnote 44. For the record, I lasted 6.5 minutes. Josh skipped out at three minutes flat to, quote, um, use the bathroom, unquote. I found his excuse specious at best. The Hiawassee Springs town singers were awesome, kind of, for their genre, whatever genre that was, which was unclear. Okay, we're like halfway through this chapter. Let me get a drink. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, my gosh. At approximately 8.30 for the 9 p.m. showing of the 82nd annual pig races, the crowd gathers. Words cannot describe the joy on a young Hiawassee Springsian child's face upon seeing his first pig race. It is magical. This year, Tammy Faye Bacon beat out David Letterham, which is only fair given the real Tammy Faye struggles with cancer. She deserved to win at something. The first few rounds were just your average pig racing, pretty standard, really. Four pigs would race around their straw-laden rings while the people would bet on who would finish first. The last round brought the throng of tired fairgoers to their feet, suspense built. And there they were, pot-bellied pigs! Joshua even smiled at this one, quiet as he was all evening. He even laughed out loud when one of the four pigs just stopped in its tracks and sat on his chubby pig hindquarters, while the others waddled aimlessly around the ring. Josh, lately I feel as lost as that pig. Which pig, Lily, Billy Goat? Josh asked mockingly. He knew exactly which pig. I smiled anyway, though. He hadn't called me that in too long. I felt a break in the tension that had been hanging between us for months, ever since Josh first mentioned us having kids. Josh smiled deeper then, kind of a nervous smile, the corner twitching up at the left side of his mouth, but the right just couldn't get on board. He took a deep, long sigh. <coughs> Lily, it's just that when we agreed to get married, you said you were turning a new leaf and going to put us before work. Josh exhaled slowly. And now, I don't know, things are different. I mean, I want you to love your work. I just want you to love me more. Where is this coming from? It wasn't a conversation to have with all those screaming pig fans around us, or maybe it was. Either way, I loved that man. I saw that he was in pain and I wanted to be in our home together. 
I didn't care that our home was still filled with cockroach dung or that we had weird landlords. I just wanted to go home. I grabbed into his pocket for the keys, gestured towards the exit, and he gratefully followed, our fingers linked. He had endured as much of the fare as he could possibly take, and he had done it for me. We drove without talking for the whole ride home. It was 20 minutes filled with country music, which was all that played from the local radio stations at that hour. They were playing that week's top song entitled something like Honky Tonk Badonk Donk, footnote 45. <coughs> Clearly a classic in the making. We walked into the dimly lit dirt path that doubled for our driveway and walked hand in hand into our house. We made love that night with a familiar tenderness and a new sense of purpose and excitement. We didn't use any kind of birth control or protection, my way of saying that I agreed. It was time. I wasn't scared then. I wanted him to know that I did value our family more than anything, that his happiness was mine. We fell asleep in each other's arms, both comforted in a way we hadn't been in way too long. In the light of the morning, Things felt very different than they did even the night before. I got up, threw on some clothes, made some coffee, and began pacing the house like an expectant father. What the F, asterisk, K, was I thinking? I took two sips of the coffee and then spat it into the sink. I might be pregnant, so no more coffee for me, I said to myself, already irritated that Josh gets to keep drinking coffee. And I don't, not even 24 hours possibly pregnant, and I was already getting a little nutty. I poured the rest of the coffee from my, quote, famous women and their important saying thing, sayings about life, unquote, muck, parentheses, that my mom had given th me through a rough, lonely time in my life, and parents, into the stained sink, and took a deep, long breath in and out. I decided to try talking to Josh about my thoughts and fears since we had joined up to face life together. I padded into our bedroom. Good morning, Josh, Joshy Sito, I said, muzzing his sandy brown hair, kissing him on the forehead, grudgingly nudging some black liquid caffeine in his direction. No milk, two sugars. He woke with half-closed eyes, wrinkling up his face as if disturbed that a new day had to go on and start without him. Once, even just a little bit conscious, he smiled at me, eyes still closed, made some sort of happy grunting sound, and motioned for me to come back to bed with him. I sat down next to him on the bed. Why dressed was all he could manage out, manage to get out. Josh was not a morning person. Come back to bed. He was trying to be as cute as he could be, but that morning, it was definitely not working. I put his mug of coffee on the stained old oak end table next to our bed and crawled back into bed with him. He quickly fell back asleep and I tried to do the same. I wasn't sure if it was the two sips of caffeine that made my heart race or the idea that my, I might have gotten pregnant the night before. I suddenly felt like I was going to vomit and I ran to the bathroom to pay homage to the porcelain bowl. As I stood there for a few moments, I didn't feel nauseated in the slightest. I realized that I was just being silly. I scooted back to bed, lifted up Josh's arm, and crawled underneath. We slept in that morning, alternating between warm snuggles and wakefulness for the next few hours. When we finally got up, Josh made us sunny side up eggs and blueberry pancakes. I hardly wanted to ruin the perfect breakfast, but I was a scrambled mix of emotions. Joshi Sito, I started. I really love you. Oh, Lily Billy Goat, I love you too. You are my everything. Josh, that's just it, I said sadly. I don't want you to be my everything. Lily, he said, pronouncing each syllable very slowly 
and with open arms gesturing for me to come and sit down on his lap at a table, still filled with the remnants of our delicious breakfast. And then, despite my best efforts at holding it in, I vomited my feelings all over my Josh. I need to have a job. And now that I've uprooted myself to be with you, it needs to be a job that I care about for me. And babies, Josh, are we really ready? Am I ready? I mean, I need to have a place to go where I have to shower and get dressed and put on work appropriate clothing. I need to be outside the house. I, I, I can't just be home full time with a tiny little screaming p -p -p pooping person. Listen to me. I'm already stuttering. I never stuttered before we moved here. And with a baby on top of everything else, I'll go completely bonkers. I have moved far away from all of my family and all of my friends, and I'm afraid of raising a child here. Will I even be a good mother? We won't be the same us anymore after a baby. We'll send holiday cards with pictures of us and our children smiling and laughing and playing in our yard. We'll become like every other boring suburban family. What's happening to us? It all came out like it was one sentence. Josh held back half a chuckle at my outburst. He motioned again for me to sit down on his lap. And this time I agreed. Lily, my love, where is all of this coming from? I love you. You love me. I thought we were doing okay. Is this all about the baby? We talked about this before we got married. I thought you wanted to have kids. I thought we were ready then. Josh, we are okay, but you know me. I don't like just okay. I'm changing so much all the time. This place is changing me. And some of that is good, but it's just so much change so fast that I don't even know who I am anymore. I couldn't take the secret letter in my mental filing cabinet another second. Have I changed too much for you? Is that why you're leaving me and going to Cornell? I started to cry. He tapped me on the nose and kissed both, both cheeks. Oh, Lily, what in the world are you talking about? I'm not going to Cornell. Where are you getting this from? It was clear to me that he hadn't recently checked the filing system I set up for him. Josh, I saw the letter. I opened it and read it and put it in your file. Why didn't we talk about this before you sent it off? What if I don't want to move back to the Northeast? There it was. I was finally getting out some good, honest communication. I felt temporarily proud of myself. Oh, Lily, I'm not running off anywhere, not without you anyway. He tried to wink at me, but I was having none of it. This is just the way our department asks us to get our names around so that when it's time to go up for tenure, our committee knows that we have other offers and it makes us more competitive. I know it doesn't make much sense, but that's the truth. I would never walk out on us. And as far as you changing, well, you have, but that is not totally a bad thing. You, Lily Walker Stone, you lovely creature, are the same fiery, brilliant uh, Lily that I married. You just live in the Wasi now, so you have had to adapt. We're always going to change. It's just that I hope we can change together. He smoothed back my hair from my face and cupped the back of my head with both hands. I probably don't tell you often enough how much I appreciate all the sacrifices you have made to be with me. I cuddled into his chest. Is it hard for you too? You never say. I have you, Lily. I have work that moves me. Our families are healthy. And we have many friends who live far away, and we get to talk to them on the phone. Sure, sometimes I wish that I could sit down with a friend or my brother and have coffee or scotch or something, but 99.9% .9 of the time, I feel like the luckiest man on earth. We're both really lucky, Josh. Life with you in the Wasi is better than life without you anywhere else. 
Okay, that's enough for this show. That was chapter 18. We're going to continue skipping over the Rosa and the Mila chapters and just focus on the Lily chapters or whatever focuses also on her relationship with Josh since this is taking so long. The whole story is uh, 40-something chapters, but once we get through, we'll have a live stream discussion about the whole story and i'll do a little summary for people who couldn't stand to listen to every every video okay the whole paid whole book is 235 pages long all right so have a great day and i'll see you at the next live stream or video thanks for tuning in justice for dan markel